welcome for all attendees uh, and welcome professor uh, bing uh, thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, on behalf of um, King, uh, on behalf of um, Mansoor University Center of Renewable Energy, we are welcoming you, and thank you very much for accepting our kind invitation. Yeah, uh, I will start uh, with a brief introduction about our speaker now. Uh, our key speaker, Professor Bing Wang. Uh, professor Bing Wang is a full prof uh, is a full professor of environmental science and engineering program at King Abdullah University. Uh, of Science and Technology, KAUST, in KSA. He received his PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara, USA, in 2008. And one year later, he joined the, uh, KAUST as one of the founding faculty members in September 2008. He is an affiliated member of Water Desalination and Reuse Center and uh, Solar Center at KAUST. He also works as a professor or at the Department of Civil Environmental Engineering uh, at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, uh, Hong Kong. His research emphasizes uh, sustainable, sustainable energy uh, driven clean water production and wastewater treatment by designing and application of advanced materials and nanotechnology. He has published over 70 papers many of which appeared in, uh, on top journals. He was uh, uh, the integral emerging uh, investigator of uh, experimental science, uh, NANO 2008, uh, 2018, and he is an advisory board member of Advanced Sustainable Systems. Uh, actually, we are very delighted to welcome you, uh, Professor Bing. And uh, the floor is yours. I will try just to share, make you share your screen. And the floor is yours now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. I want to make sure that my mic is working. That's perfect. It's working now. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can you see the screen? Yeah. All right. Uh, Thank you. Hello, uh, everyone. Okay, so um, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, thank Mohammed again for a very nice introduction. Uh, so I'm very happy uh, and very excited to be here uh, to talk to this broad audience about my research on solar driven clean water and energy production. Now, I'll start by saying that whether you are a believer of global warming or not, the year of 2020, this year is on track to be one of the hardest year ever recorded. Paris Agreement as a word to do whatever it takes to limit the global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. However, it looks like that we're going to fail on this target. Now we have our second target, 2 degrees Celsius. And you can see the scenario under 2 degrees Celsius warming is much worse than 1.5 degrees. On the water side, one kind of credible source projected that by 2040, which is 20 years from now, more than 70, more than 70 of the world population will be under severe water stress. And you can see from this, um, this figure here, looks like Egypt will be okay. Saudi Arabia will be under severe water stress. Hong Kong, where I'm currently at, will be under severe water stress by 2040, 20 years from now. Now, we have severe problems with climate change, with water stress, 
the scenario of energy is not looking good. And you can see from here, our demand for energy is still rising. It's projected that by 2050, the global electricity demand will be doubled based on what we are uh, in 2020. Therefore, with all those together, you see the water energy climate nexus is not in a good shape. Some people even go as far as saying that we are pushing Earth down to a path of no return. However, there is always hope. And you can see from this figure here, the global solar irradiation map shows that our Earth is blessed with massive, massive solar energy. It is true that the total amount of solar energy Earth receive in just one hour, one hour is more than what the entire world needs for one year. And, uh, you know, solar energy is free. It's massive and it's clean. Therefore, it gives us a lot of hope to solve our current problem. So I hope all of these slides give you an engaging and interesting background uh, based on which I'll give uh, my presentation. It is my intention that this presentation uh, is accessible, understandable by general audience. So this means the presentation will have to leave some very detailed scientific discussion out. However, if you are interested in um, you know, anything I talk about, I will be talking about uh, you know, in a scientific sense. Uh, I'll be happy to uh, to uh, you know talk about scientific detail uh, after the presentation. So in the next twenty minutes or so, I'll be talking about two uh, topics. The first one is solar water evaporation and the solar distillation. Now the second one is atmospheric water harvesting. This atmospheric water harvesting in this part of my talk will be fully solar energy driven. Now let's start with the first, solar water evaporation and the solar distillation. One question, do you know where the first solar steel was invented? Well, the answer may or may not be a surprise to some of you. Uh, take a look at the figure on the left hand side. The first solar I'm sorry. Steel. Hey. I'm sorry, yes. Professor Bing. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, some uh, attendees asked about uh, raising the voice a little bit, so I'm so sorry for interruption. Okay, okay, all right, all right. Um, okay, um, all right, I'll do my best. Otherwise, I'll put on my uh, headphone. Uh, maybe I'll do this right away. Yeah. Um, raise my voice. Uh, I hope this will work. All right. Okay, is this better? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, don't worry. So uh, the first solar steel was invented in this region. Uh, in the Middle East, 500 years ago by Arab alchemists. So the first solar steel has uh, a look of what it's showing in this figure on the left hand side. Now the design of the solar steel has not been changed ever since. The figure on the right hand side shows you how a typical solar steel works. Let me very quickly walk you through this. Uh, you see, sunlight comes in, heat up the entire bulk of water. 
This bulk water in this case can be your seawater, contaminated lake water, groundwater, uh, surface water, so on and so forth. Now you have now the bulk of water with high temperature, there will be evaporation, vapor is generated. Then vapor will be con uh, condensed on the internal surface of the top cover. Then the liquid water is produced and then collected. This is how a typical solar steel can produce fresh water from various type of uh, water sources. Now, of course, you ask this question. Why is this variation technology nowadays popular? Well, I can say this. In the past five years, there was a small change that was made to conventional solar steel. That change, however small it was, gave solar steel a new life. Now, the figure in this slide here, uh, the left, left hand side shows you a regular, a conventional solar steel, while the right hand side shows you the new design in the solar steel. You see, in the conventional solar steel, you have bulk water heating scheme because you have either water being your light absorber or your black light absorber at the bottom of your water. Now, the small change was this. In the past five years, people moved the solar photothermal material from the bottom of the water to the interface between water and the air. Now, in this case, with the material at the interface, we have an interfacial heating. So it is this interfacial heating that give this very ancient technology a new life. Regarding the energy balance in a typical interfacial solar evaporation, here I'm only talking about the first step in solar destination, which is the evaporation of water. Now in this part, solar energy once being converted to heat has five different pathways. And you can see here, um, you know, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna very quickly tell you uh, that in these five pathways, only one is what you want to have, which is uh, evaporation. So in the past five years, people work very hard to maximize the energy that come to evaporation side, at the same time to minimize all of the energy loss to other four pathways. All right, so um, again, the details uh, will be uh, skipped here. Now, with the purpose of maximizing energy that go to water evaporation, in the past five years, there has been very fast, significant development in photothermal structure. I listed here in this slide um, four stages of photothermal structure evolution in the past of four or six, uh, four to six years. Now um, you know that without any photothermal material uh, being in a solar steel you have a bulk water heating. And in a typical bulk water heating, your energy efficiency is only 25% also. Uh, so that means that 75% of the energy or solar energy, the system harvested is not going to water evaporation. It's considered as a waste. So in 2014 and 15, uh, that was kind of starting point of interfacial heating. In the first generation, uh, there was a self-floating design, which boosted the energy efficiency from 25% to 56%. Now later uh, in 2015 and 2017, people realized uh, you have to have some heat barrier that can keep the surface heat 
from coming down to uh, bulk water. And you can see here, at that point, uh, the thinking was that we have to combine the heat barrier with water channel. Now, this design worked to a certain extent at that point because the energy efficiency was increased to 73% at that, uh, at that stage. Later, uh, in 2017, people realized that this porous heat barrier design was wrong because when you combine these two together, you cannot eliminate uh, water conduction down to the bulk of water by water actually seeding inside the porous heat barrier here. Therefore, in 2017, the design was to separate those two uh, apart. You have your water channel, you have your um, heat barrier. Those two are completely on two different uh, 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 substrates. Uh, that was uh, that was 2017. Now um, in 2018, uh, there was a very exciting development in this field because that's when you uh, you saw some three-dimensional photothermal structure being published uh, in literature. Now with three-dimensional uh, photothermal structure system can actually increase the solar energy utilization efficiency all the way to 100%. In some cases, some system can actually harvest ebbing environmental heat to help water evaporation. In that case, you can make your actual or apparent uh, energy efficiency greater than 100%. Now, I hope this gives you uh, a kind of uh, big picture of what ha happened with the thermal, uh, photothermal structure development in the past five, six years. Now, so far, I have been talking about only water evaporation. Now, let's put everything together uh, to take a look at what's the performance of the solar steel to give us the final product which is clean water, right? So I show you here uh, some photos I found on the internet. Those are typical household solar steel. As you can see here, uh, this is a conventional one. Now the one on the uh, right-hand side is the one with interficial uh, water uh, uh, heating uh, design. And the bottom one is another uh, conventional one. Now, what I can tell you here is that all of those design with or without interficial heating will not give you very high or satisfactory water production rate. With those design, you typically would expect that this system would give you water production rate of 0.2 to 0.5 liters of fresh water out of each square meter of light absorption area per hour, right? So I don't think you are happy with this water production rate. Well, if you say ideally for this design, I can make energy efficiency of water production to be 100%, then I tell you, your number will only be about 1.5 liters out of one square meter per hour. That's your upper limit for this design. Can we somehow break this limit? Now, um, I want to show you here. Uh, so we, my research uh, last year came up with a new design uh, for solar steel. In this system, as you can see uh, from the figure on the right-hand side, um, when the solar energy comes in, right, we have um, we have kind of membrane destination uh, of multiple stage uh, right under the photothermal material. Now, with this design, we are able to utilize the same amount of energy that comes 
into the system for multiple times. Therefore, with this design, we have a hope that it can give us a water production, a water production rate that is actually greater than 1.5 liters per uh, square meter per hour, right? So um, the photo on the left-hand side is uh, our first trial of the device fabrication. It looks, uh, you know, not, not beautiful, not pretty, or you may say it looks ugly, but it actually worked very well. Now, uh, before showing you uh, some uh, water production performance, I want to very quickly switch gear and uh, uh, show you something you, I think you know very well, photovoltaic panel, right? We know that PV is nowadays the most popular way of converting solar energy to produce electricity. And uh, um, it is currently uh, behind hydropower, but the capacity, the global capacity of PV panel is increasing very fast. Most likely by 2024, PV will be the number one in all of the renewables. So PV at that time will uh, surpass the capacity of hydropower. And um, the reason I talk about this is because PV has a problem. Now, as you can see from the figure on the left-hand side, PV can only convert a small amount of the light or solar irradiation it harvested to electricity. So that small amount in commercial PV panel is typically between 10 to 20%. Now, this is to say that about 80 to 90% of the solar energy the panel harvested is not going to give you electricity. Instead, it gives you or it produces massive amount of heat. Now, due to the heat on the panel, those panels are very hard during uh, daytime. And uh, um, the high temperature of the PV panel has two drawbacks. First, it will reduce, first, it will reduce the electricity production by the panel. Secondly, it will uh, shorten the lifetime of, of the PV panel. All right, so um, now, there are a lot of heat coming from PV panel. What if we actually use this heat to do water distillation? So this is the idea that we, um, uh, we combine with our design I showed you previously. Therefore, the new design here is that we're gonna forget about the previous design using photothermal material. We're gonna be using PV panel directly as are photothermal material. Now, the rest of the design, you may say, is similar, if not all the same. Now, if you ask, why do you make those devices? I say there are many, many benefits. First, now we are using PV to produce water. So the device will give us both electricity and fresh water. And because there's no additional light absorption area. Therefore, the device can utilize solar energy to its full capacity. Now, look at this. We are producing the expected amount of solar electricity and fresh water on the same device. So there's no additional land requirement. So, with those very promising benefits, can we make the device? Well, let me show you. Uh, we made small scale devices. And uh, here I present to you some very exciting performance of water production 
of electricity production. I'm very pleased to tell you, at that time, the small scale device, as I show in the border, was able to produce water at the rate of 1.8 to 2.0 liters out of one square meter per hour. This is already beyond 1.5, uh, the ceiling for the conventional solar steel. What's more is that this water production did not affect regular electricity production by the same PV panel. So you get the electricity you expect. At the same time, you got a lot of additional free water. So um, this is the, um, the general idea of this PV MD device. So we published this paper in uh, July 2019, last year. It was a big hit. It was really, really, um, uh, you know, uh, covered, highlighted by many international media. Now, uh, you ask me where do we go with this uh, technology? I say to you that the water production rate I show you in the previous slide is still not what we expect. This slide show you the um, modeled or simulated water production rate. You see, you can actually push the water production rate all the way to 10 liters per uh, uh, out of one square meter per hour. And uh, we still have a long way to go. Well, before getting to our final target, I always have a very wild dream. You see, by 2025, we will have a lot of PV panels across the globe. And um, if you make assumptions, say at that time, let's assume every PV panel is PVMD. And uh, you know, let's assume there are 200 days of solar irradiation every year. And also let's assume that each square meter of the PVMD will give us eight liters of fresh water per day. Now this uh, unit here is day, not hour. So it's reasonable uh, based on the results we got so far. Now, you may be surprised with those assumptions, if you do your calculation right, you will get some very crazy number. There will be 12 billion cubic meter of fresh water produced by all of the PVMD. How much is this? Or how much does this water represent? Well, it's 30% of the world drinking water consumption in 2017. So, you know, it is a crazy idea, but as long as everyone works hard, we are, we are getting, we are getting closer to this, um, bold idea or you may call this dream as you know at a certain point now um i'm gonna quickly move on to the uh, second topic of atmospheric water harvesting i still have seven minutes all right so um do you know that we have really a lot of water in the air let me quickly show you the number so the total amount of water that we have in our atmosphere is about six times of water in all of the river on earth surprise right so i was very motivated by this fact so i started my uh, research on water harvesting from air uh, about six years ago when we started i actually started with fog harvesting and uh, we work on mimicking uh, the fantastic surface texture of Namib desert beetle. And uh, we got a certain uh, uh, progress on this regard. But later I realized fog harvesting has its own limitation because to have a fog, you need your relative humidity to be close to 100%. This does not happen 
uh, even in coastal area, uh, I, I work in cows. Uh, I typically can see a couple of days of fog uh, within one year uh, in cows. Cows is a coastal city uh, near Jeddah. So, um, you know, that means you don't expect a lot of fog uh, elsewhere uh, in Saudi Arabia. By the way, so we move on. Uh, we we are more interested in water in vapor phase because this is what you know. This is present uh, where wherever you are. Uh, speaking of harvesting water vapor, there is a big competitor called refrigeration based atmospheric water harvesting. In the interest of time, let me just tell you that. Uh, this technology has a lot of drawbacks. Uh, it consumes uh, electricity and not suitable for low humidity region. And uh, as you can see from this figure on the uh, bottom right, you see the energy consumption for producing one liter of water by this technology is very high. Therefore, is there anything that can help us <clears throat> to harvest a vapor without using electricity. So we are interested in solar energy driven absorption based uh, atmospheric water harvesting. The idea is this, you're gonna have some special sorbent. The sorbent will absorb uh, water vapor from air, typically at night. Uh, when the day is here, the sun is up and uh, you will have solar energy to heat up your uh, sorbent. Uh, water will be released as vapor. So you have a can, uh, confined space to condense the water vapor. Then you can produce fresh drinking water this way. So uh, this is how this technology worked. It has simple setup. It does not consume electricity and it's suitable for a wide range of humidity. So in the next five minutes, let me quickly walk you through uh, what we have been working on in the past five years on this. Now, our first generation material uh, was salt. And uh, the absorption was based on chemical reaction, hydration reaction of the salt with the water vapor in the air. Now. For this generation of the material, we were able to harvest water vapor from very dry air of only 15% of the relative humidity. 15% of the relative humidity. And uh, the water production rate was kind of low because we were able to produce 0.21 gram of the water out of one gram of the sorbent. Well, you may ask, where can you use this? I have a very interesting scenario for you. Think of yourself in the middle of a big desert with very dry climate and the relative humidity in the desert at night is 20%, which is very dry if you talk about nighttime humidity. Now there's no water in sight. What do you do? You will be thirsty, right? And with our device, at least you will get a small amount of drinking water to make you survive a little bit longer. So this is what this first generation device or material can give you. Now we quickly move on to the second generation. Uh, where we want to have a sorbent that can give us higher capacity. So we work with salt, with the hydrogel. Now in this generation of the material, we were really able to increase the water absorption capacity or water production capacity to 1.5, 1.75 gram uh, of the water produced out of one gram of the sorbent. However, there is a significant problem for the second generation material. 
as you can see from those two fingers, it really takes a very long time, 14 hours at least, for this material to reach its water vapor absorption equilibrium. It's very slow. So for the third generation, we're thinking about some new design that can give us faster vapor absorption kinetics. Now, in this case, we turn to nano design. Our design was this nano hollow capsule. With in, you know, within this capsule, we put special vapor sorbent. Now, together with this design, because it has a higher uh, air sorbent interface, we expect that it will give us faster connected for both sorption and desorption. It worked actually very well. We synthesized our material, and this is a video clip. Okay, uh, my clock says I uh, I'm short of time, but very quickly I have two, three. Uh, no, 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 take your time. <laughs> Actually, uh, okay. the audience uh, enjoying the the. the okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much. A big relief. Okay. So. Um, you can. So you can see from this video uh, here. Uh, upon turning on a light source, you saw there was immediate vapor release. So this tells us that new design with the hollow capsule really gives the material a very fast vapor uh, desorption kinetics. And uh, the uh, desorption kinetics was improved as well. As you can see here uh, in this D figure, uh, with this new design, we were able to shorten the uh, equilibration time from 14 hours in our previous material to three hours in the new design in this third generation. So um, we improve this uh, that so that we, with this material, can do actually multiple reperception desorption cycles. We were not able to do this in both of our first and second generation material. Now, in the third generation material, we did three cycles, three cycles of the um, sorption desorption. We were able uh, to increase the um, uh, total amount of the uh, water that can be captured uh, by 300%. Now, since we uh, have gone that this far of having multiple cycles, we ask ourselves, can we actually go one step further to have continuous absorption desorption design? Now, this is something we are currently working on. As you can see here, uh, this is our device. In the middle, there is a rotating uh, motor. And uh, we persorbent, uh, as shown on the right hand side, is wrapped around this motor. Uh, there are two chambers in this device. Uh, the top chamber is sealed. So when the sorbent is in the top chamber, it releases vapor. When it is in the second, uh, uh, the second chamber at the bottom, it's open to the open air. Uh, this is where the sorption takes place. So with this design, uh, we, um, as I can, as I show you here, were able to harvest water in the top chamber. Um, this is still a work in early progress. I hope I can give you guys some uh, exciting uh, update uh, soon. All right, so um, here I have an a interesting application of atmospheric water harvesting. Now, you, as I said to you, PV has high temperature during daytime. If you can cool down PV just by a little bit, it will increase the electricity generation. So we are thinking, because we can actually harvest water from air, and water is a very good solvent because when you evaporate water, it takes away a lot of heat from uh, the hosting subject. So this is the idea. We want to combine with water vapor uh, harvesting 
uh, to help PV to cool down. Now, um, we took our second generation hard gel material and uh, we put this on the backside of a commercial PV panel. And you can see here, this is hard gel. This is a PV panel with hard gel on the backside. Now, once you have this, the rest is very simple. Just let the whole system open in air at night. During daytime, when the PV panel is heated up by solar irradiation, the heat of the PV will evaporate the water in the uh, sorbent material as a back. Now, water evaporation is supposed to take heat off the PV. So that's the idea. And uh, I show you in this figure that with the cooling layer, without the cooling layer, and the different solar intensity, you see the difference in the temperature of the PV is actually very significant, more than 10 degrees Celsius. 10 degrees Celsius temperature reduction is significant for PV. And uh, we further take the uh, design to the field. And uh, our field experiment is very uh, uh, encouraging. And you can see here the electricity generation uh, by the PV panel with the cooling design is 13 to 19 percent higher than the same PV panel without the solvent cooling design. So um, uh, this is something we only reported three months ago. We are still working on um, uh, solving um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, scaling up issues. Um, so um, uh, we hope we can uh, uh, we can um, uh, make some significant progress in the coming uh, in the coming years. And um, well, as a conclusion, I just want to say that uh, solar energy holds a lot of hope for us to solve uh, water, energy, climate crisis. And uh, atmospheric water is an unconventional water source. It can give us more than we we'll expect. And also to the very young audience, I encourage you to think outside the box and uh, to work always uh, collaboratively with people outside your field. The solutions to our current grand challenges is always from interdisciplinary uh, collaboration. So with that, uh, I still have one more motivational slide uh, to show you. It's about water. At this point in the world, there are about 800 million people who still don't have direct access to clean water. So this lack of clean water leads to more than 200 million human hours spent majorly by women and girls just to fetch water for their entire family. If and when we can make atmospheric water harvesting and uh, we can make uh, those PV, MD, affordable to them, those 200 million human hours will be saved. They can be used for much more productive activity. So the world at that point will be a much better place for them and of course for every one of us. Now, um, that's all I have for you regarding to, uh, you know, the solar energy and uh, water um, uh, production. Uh, I have two, uh, two more slides. Uh, I started uh, uh, my appointment as associate editor for environmental science and technology uh, in February this year. And uh, I want to introduce this journal to those who do not know. Uh, EST 
is published by American Chemical Society. It's a very prestigious journal in the field of environmental science and engineering. And uh, in the family of EST, we are now have four journals. Uh, EST, EST Letters. And uh, in June this year, uh, there was two edition of two new journals into the uh, big family. So now we have ACS EST Engineering, ACS uh, EST Water. I hope, uh, you know, in the future, some of you will uh, submit your manuscript to us. And, uh, uh, and I hope that they will be finally uh, accepted and published on one of those journals. With that, I would like to uh, thank Muhammad again and thank everyone of you in the audience for your attention. Then uh, we have uh, a lot of time, uh, you know, to discuss about your thoughts, your vision, your suggestion uh, on those important topics. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bing. And uh, actually, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Sahar has already joined us during the webinar, and she wants to. Uh, she is already inter, uh, happy with this uh, presentation, and she wants to speak to you. Actually, hello. Thank you, Dr. Wang, for this very, oh, thank very you. lecture. Oh, I love it. <laughs> you are very I'm smart. glad that you you made it. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I have just a small question. Uh, do you think the heat coming from the BV, non-concentrated BV, yes. uh, deserve all of this effort? I mean, is it deserved or just a small portion of energy? Your voice is a little bit broken. I, I heard <laughs> half of your story, uh, your okay. question. I, I will say it again. I'm talking about with the heat. Out yeah. of the BV cell, does it deserve right. all of this effort? I mean, it's not that much, is it? Well, you know, if you talk about regular PV, well, um, well, it is, it is, um, as I said, uh, it is eighty to ninety percent of the solar energy that the PV panel harvested. You may say this is, well, this is small amount because solar energy has a low area energy intensity. Well, this is true. But if we can cost effectively utilize this with the heat to produce something useful for us, you know, why not? Because getting solar energy from a sky needs infrastructure. You already have the PV panel that take those energy down to us. We just don't know how to use 80 to 90% of the energy that we have already have a hand on. So from the sustainability point of view, from energy efficiency point of view, uh, from a circular economy uh, point of view, I would just say, you know, uh, if we can cheaply utilize this uh, heat to do something useful, it's 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 a worthy effort. I'm not sure suitable. if that answer your question. Yeah, maybe it is more suitable for the concentrated BB. Um, we use concentrated. Well, it, well, for the concentrated PV, I guess there's a, a you know there. You know, there's a mechanism already for the heat utilization. Uh, there is already a heat utilization mechanism design. That's my understanding. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Thank 